So recently I made a video where I talked about uh, having got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in theoretical physics, why I then didn't want to go on and do a PhD. And in that video I briefly mentioned the research internships that I've done uh, during my undergraduate degree and I think I said that they've been really interesting or something but anyway one of the top comments on that video was asking me to talk more about the internships I did so um, that's this today. <laughs> So I wanted to get an internship for the summer after I finished first year and uh, I think I applied for two, um, I can definitely remember one, but like I didn't even get any interviews or anything. The reason why I'm telling you this though is that as a first year or even a second year physics student it can be really hard to get a research internship purely because you, you don't know much, especially compared to a third or a fourth year who you're kind of competing against for places. Like, it's definitely not unheard of to get one. I do know some people who did, but it, it's rare. So just kind of don't beat yourself up about it or don't read too much into it if you don't get one. Like, it, it's no reflection of your competence as a physics student. Also, just kind of as a general point, it's really not the end of the world if you don't get to do any internships. So, for example, I have a friend who's incredibly bright and she's like really, really passionate about her degree. Um, I'm not sure I know anyone who cares as much about like a specific area of physics as she does and she applied to quite a lot of internships and like really she was just really unlucky basically and she ended up being the top person on the waiting list for lots of them um but she's absolutely brilliant and she's got a fully funded offer now for a phd and an area that she loves at a university that she loves so like not getting any internships like it, it doesn't have to matter also one of the internships i applied for in first year and got a flat out rejected from um and this is the reason why i can remember it it was for the uh, organization that i'm actually going to start work for in august um so yeah life is strange sometimes <laughs> So like I said, I didn't manage to get any internships in the summer after first year, so that kind of made me really want to get one in the summer after second year. Now, my uh, where I went to secondary school didn't offer anything like computer science, so I'd never done any form of programming at all until I started my degree. And at Lancaster, we're not taught to program until first term of second year, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, anyway, that meant that by second year I'd learnt to program, and this kind of made internships, like so many more internships, accessible to me. A huge amount of physics research involves some form of scientific computing. So anyway, at some point, which might have been in first term, I, I can't really remember, I had a meeting with my academic advisor. Uh, an academic advisor is what Lancaster called the lecturer that's kind of like assigned to you and like monitors your progress and you can go to them with welfare um, stuff and yeah. And anyway, in one of my meetings that I had with him, uh, I basically said, I, I really want to do an internship. Do you know anyone who's taking on students this year? And he said, you can work for me if you want. So I ended up doing an eight week particle physics uh, experimental particle physics internship with him. The funding for that project I had to kind of apply for separately and that ended up coming from uh, the Ogden Trust which is a physics charity. I don't think they do anymore but they used to sponsor internships for kind of ex-state school pupils who'd uh, come, kind of come from areas where people wouldn't normally uh, pursue physics at university. I'm pretty sure my old secondary school was involved because it was like in the middle of the countryside so so what i was doing in this project was i was looking at neutrinos and neutrinos are these tiny kind of ghost-like elementary particles that make up all known matter and can be found like everywhere throughout our galaxy but the problem is they interact with basically nothing so they're really really hard to study like they'll be passing through you and you won't even know they're there we do have some detectors though that can detect them. They're normally built like underground because that shields them from background radiation. You can kind of see what you're looking for more clearly and they're like huge, like properly huge. So even though they don't pick up many neutrinos per unit area um, because you've got these huge huge detectors you know they're gonna pick up something that you can study. Anyway, we don't really know many places that neutrinos can come from, but a couple of weeks before I was due to start my internship, a paper was published which kind of for the first time, some neutrinos had been detected uh, in a detector and they were basically able to say, look, we know where these come from. So this detector was actually called the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, which is in Antarctica. And they'd managed to, um, they'd detected some neutrinos and they basically managed to trace them back up into the sky and work out where they came from. And they came from this thing called a blazer. Um, so a blazer is basically the bright region in the centre of a galaxy that has this kind of stream of ionised radiation that's travelling towards us on Earth at almost the speed of light. Anyway, this uh, paper was huge news because it was the first time that a neutrino detector had been used to kind of like pinpoint something in space, kind of like a neutrino telescope I guess. So what I ended up doing in my internship was I had data from another neutrino detector, so this one was the uh, 
Minos fire detector, which is a detector in the Sudan mine in northern Minnesota. And this detector was actually built for a different experiment called the Minos experiment, which essentially uh, involved sending a beam of neutrinos through two detectors, a near detector and a far detector, and kind of looking at how they change throughout that time through the journey between them. But yeah, anyway, that's kind of irrelevant because the data I was looking at was from when the beam was off. So this detector was when it was just kind of detecting the kind of background neutrinos that were there anyway, rather than the ones from the beam. So essentially what I was doing over the eight weeks was I was looking at the positions of these neutrinos um, that we detected here on Earth, and then I was also looking at the positions of all these blazars surrounding Earth uh, in space. And I was trying to see if these blazars in space lined up with these neutrinos that we detected here on Earth. And I was also trying to see, like, if they do match up, is it because the blazars are creating the neutrinos, or is it just a coincidence? Because we have a lot of neutrinos and we have a lot of blazars, so, you know, maybe if they do match up, maybe that's just chance? Um, ha like, how do we know? So it turns out the way that we know this is basically a lot of statistical analysis um, and all of the analysis by the way I was doing uh, by programming in a language called C++ which uh, I, I taught myself a little bit of before I started the internship but I was basically kind of learning it as I went along so uh, for example one of the things I did to test whether the neutrinos and the blazars were lining up because the blazars were creating these neutrinos or whether it was just some kind of random chance was a thing called a Monte Carlo simulation which basically involved making a second data set of kind of fake neutrinos that I created so that they had the same properties as the first data set and then looking at this second data set which was like fake neutrinos they weren't real I just kind of made a model uh, and seeing if these fake neutrinos lined up with blazars as well as the real neutrinos did so obviously if they did look like they lined up we'd know that that was just chance because these neutrinos aren't real they're just something we've kind of created ourselves randomly so there's like no way they can have come from these blazars one of the things I remember being really difficult was we had the positions of these uh, neutrinos on earth and we had the positions of these blazars in space uh, and we kind of needed to compare these two positions but obviously earth rotates and earth moves and trying to compare these two coordinate systems was actually really difficult anyway yes that's kind of like a brief summary of what I was doing um, and it was a fantastic experience my supervisor he was completely ace he gave me like exactly the right level of support so that even though I was dealing with stuff that was actually like pretty complicated I never really felt out of my depth but I also didn't feel like I was following a script either. Uh, the other cool thing about that internship was that I was working in the experimental particle physics kind of uh, PhD office and there were some other summer interns there and it was just nice because it meant I got to know PhD students in the department and it meant I got to know the other interns who were doing physics at Lancaster with me but they were in the years above. Um, yeah, it was just a good way to get to know people who went to the same uni as me and were in the same department as me but I maybe hadn't talked to that much because we were in different year groups. So fast forward to Christmas of second year, uh, in my undergrad I had four weeks off for Christmas and my department advertised an internship that went over those four weeks which I applied for and got. So it was based in the Lancaster Physics Department but it was kind of funded by and it was a project set by the Northwest branch of the Institute of Physics um, and it was essentially uh, an outreach product. So the Institute of Physics had a light cube, I'll try and get a picture of it and put it here. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to take this light cube around secondary schools and show it to the students there and get students interested in physics through uh, the physics of music. So they wanted to be able to play music into this cube and the cube to then uh, have like some kind of visual display of the frequencies and the harmonics that they could then use as a talking point and a kind of like hands-on educational display so you know the kind of thing that you might find in a museum or something. So anyway they wanted to hire an undergraduate student that could kind of program this cube over Christmas and get it ready. So the cube had a microphone built in already and the LEDs that were part of the cube, they had a library uh, in Python that you could easily use to kind of light up the LEDs and change the colour. So it might sound like it was going to be a very easy project, uh, but it wasn't. <laughs> so if you play a musical note into this cube, uh, the microphone will pick up the sound wave and then you can do something called a Fourier transform on the sound wave, which basically takes the sound wave and it gives you the frequencies that make it up and you'll end up with something like this, where you have the fundamental frequency, the first harmonic, the second harmonic, and so on. So if you want to know what note is being played, what you have to do is you have to take this Fourier transformed wave and you have to find the fundamental frequency and that will tell you the note that's being played. And yeah, that's it. But the problem is, how can a computer look at this wave and kind of pick out the fundamental frequency? From looking at this, 
this you might think that you should just tell the computer to search for uh, the largest peak because that's going to be the fundamental frequency but the problem is this isn't always the case and this is where it got complicated. You might have for some instruments like the first harmonic might be louder or the second harmonic might be the loudest one or you might just have a load of background noise if people are kind of stood around talking. So uh, there are lots of different ways you can deal with this and the one I ended up using was you can take your original signal and you can multiply it by a half so you've kind of shrunk it down. So now your first harmonic will line up with your fundamental frequency. So if you now multiply these two signals together, because the fundamental frequency and the first harmonic are lining up, that peak where the fundamental frequency is will get a little bit higher and everything else will get a lot smaller because it's being multiplied by something very small. So we can do the same thing again, this time multiplying the original signal by a third to shrink it even more. And this time the second harmonic lines up with the fundamental frequency. So again, the fundamental frequency grows a bit and we complete this so on with a quarter and a fifth and so on until we're basically sure that the fundamental frequency is taller than everything else. And then we can just look for this tallest peak um, and that will give us the fundamental frequency and that will give us the note that's being played. Anyway, all that signal analysis was the kind of really complicated stuff that took up most of my time. Uh, and tone detection, so working out what note is being played, uh, is actually a current area of research in computer science, so um, it definitely wasn't as easy as I was expecting it to be. But once I had that all sorted, the uh, making the cube actually display that information was actually pretty easy and it was very fun. If you want to know what the finished product looked like, um, I'll leave a link in the description because I took a video and I put it on Instagram at the time. I would repost it here, but uh, I'm playing music into it, which obviously I can't edit out, otherwise the video will make no sense. And then I'm worried about getting copyright striked. But yeah, it looked quite cool, so I'll leave the link if you want it. Then third year summer, so this was right after I'd graduated, I did another internship. The title of this one was uh, Efficient Simulation of Quantum Trajectories, but I'm not going to talk through it because it was a theoretical physics internship um, and it would be very hard for me to do a lay summary of, but it basically involved using Python to create a simulation. This project came about because um, I was originally going to be at Lancaster for four years and in fourth year at Lancaster uh, the main thing you do is a master's project, which is this big research project that you do over the course of the year. So I had two lecturers kind of jointly offer me a really cool project, but unfortunately I found out I wasn't going to be at Lancaster for fourth year uh, because I, I went to Oxford to do my master's, but this project was really Cool and I kind of still wanted the chance to give it a go so I asked them if they'd mind if I did it instead as an internship over the summer and they were both like yeah sure which was really kind so yes I did that over the September after I finished I'm pretty sure it's September after I finished my degree so just before I started my master's and again the funding for that I applied for separately and that came from the Ogden Trust anyway yeah those are the internships that I did and I really really don't think I'd have got the job that I have without having done them because internships they're basically the reason why I know C++ and Python and they're also the reason why I got quite competent at scientific computing like they taught me a lot more programming than I would have learned if I'd have just done the compulsory degree modules I also found them so much more fun than stuff I did as part of my degree because they were very open-ended so it didn't feel like I was just following a script um, and doing things that people had done before but like I said internships can be really hard to get so like just really don't read too much into it if you get turned down for anything but I, I think they're worth applying for anyway also like congrats if you made it to the end I do realize this will be quite a long and physics heavy video but hopefully my explanations kind of make sense <laughs> see you next time which will probably be a video about um physics jobs you can get outside of academia because that was the other comment that I got a lot on my um why I'm not doing a PhD video so yeah if you're one of the people that was asking for that um watch out if it's not the next video I'll make it soon um yeah, see you next time.